Hi there, I'm Keaton. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way that you can do that is by texting River Connect. That's one word to the number 97,000. You can also head to our website, theriverchurch.cc, to learn more about us in upcoming events. Lastly, if you want to give to the River Church, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321 or head to our website and click the Give tab. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Morning, everybody. If you got a Bible, let's grab them together. Open up to the New Testament, to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5 is where we're going to be. It's towards the end of the scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5. If you're a guest, I want to welcome you. Thanks for being here with us. If you're here and you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you. You can take out your phone. You can download a Bible app or the River Church app, and you can follow along there. There's a Bible feature on there. 1 Peter chapter 5, we are concluding today our series on authority, the four lanes of authority that we see in the scripture, so government, work, home, and then today we'll be looking at the fourth and final one that we see here in 1 Peter chapter 5, and it deals with the church. Let's pick up in verse number 1. The apostle Peter writes, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So this is the apostle Peter. This is the one who walked with Jesus for three years. This is the one who did, in fact, betray Jesus, or not betray, but denied Jesus three times the night that Jesus was arrested. He witnessed the sufferings of Christ from a distance, He was the one that very night who said, Jesus, if all of these others betray you, I will not. He was very confident in himself, and he failed. But he was also the one, when he heard the news about the resurrected Christ, he and John, the apostle, ran to the tomb of Jesus. They were so intrigued. They were so curious uh, by this news from Mary Magdalene. They went there. And they saw the empty tomb, and things began to change for them. Peter is the one who would be restored by Jesus after the resurrection. At the end of the Gospel of John, the story is told of Jesus asking Peter three times, do you love me? And he is recommissioned by Jesus. He's there when Jesus ascends into heaven, and this is the same apostle Peter who would stand at the day of Pentecost in the same city a month or so prior where he was fearful of being arrested and killed. Now a month or so later, he is standing in the same town and he is fearless for the name of Jesus Christ. Church history would tell us that at the end of his life, he would be marched out to be crucified. And Peter said, and this is history, said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner as the Lord. And so they flipped him upside down and killed him that way. So Peter went from being a very temperamental, unpredictable, mouthy, in some ways we could say, fisherman, to being an incredible soldier, faithful ambassador for the name of Jesus Christ. And so at the end, later in his life, he would write these couple letters, epistles, as we know them as. And so here in verse number one, he says, I exhort the elders, meaning I encourage the elders. We'll talk about the elders in a moment. But he says, as a fellow elder. Here he doesn't say, remember me, the apostle Peter, all of those great things that I've done, all of those um, things that I've witnessed, the Mount of Transfiguration, the walking on the water with Jesus, all of those different things. So you see a, a different man here. You see a very humble man who's saying, listen, I'm a fellow elder with you, and I have witnessed the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. So just like you, I'm a little different in the sense that I've witnessed the sufferings of Christ with my own eyes, but in In the same way as you are, I'm looking forward to the glory that is to be revealed. I'm looking to eternity in heaven. 
And so he's speaking to, in this portion here, he's speaking to a group called the elders. And we see in verse 2, we begin to get a more full idea of who he's speaking to. Peter says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. The word shepherd in the Bible is the same word as the word pastor. And so Peter is writing here, specifically in this portion, he's speaking to pastors. The word elder there, sometimes we'll see the word elder or pastor or even sometimes bishop or overseer. All of those are really interchangeable terms in the Bible. One commentator said it this way, elder denotes the dignity of the office, bishop denotes its function, meaning to oversee. As I was prepping for this, I realized that this will be one of the most difficult messages to speak. I've been talking about God and government type things in the church for a long time, and it's easy to talk about work issues and challenges. Some of those passages of the Bible are very explicit, very clear. Uh, teaching on home, Keaton did that last week. But this week, we're going to talk about authority in the church. And I just want to pause before we continue moving through the scripture to say this. I'm not mad at anybody. So if you think, oh my goodness, he's upset at me and he's talking to me, I just want you to know I'm not. I have no angst against anybody in this room or really anybody in our church. I live a very, very blessed life as a pastor. I am so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for our church and the other elders and pastors that I get to serve with. I am so blessed beyond words. Sometimes people will say, hey, is there any job in the world, dream, you know, church job that you would take? And um, th there's, there's none. It's not like, hey, if that church called me, I'd be like, oh, that looks exciting. No. So it's kind of crazy to, to just realize how blessed and fortunate uh, I am to serve and to care for you and to be part of this church. So just so you know, I'm not mad at anyone here. I'm not trying to set anything specific straight. Like, hey, our church stinks at this. And I'm going to be real passive aggressive about it, which I don't know how to be passive aggressive. Let me take that back. Our church stinks at this, and I'm going to try to be aggressive about it and fix it. I don't, I don't have any of those things. I also know that for many of you sitting in here, this is not your first church, and this is not your last church. I'm not your first pastor or your last pastor. That's okay. I also know that many of you may have come from another church, and so when we talk about church authority, it may trigger or stir some things up in you because you have had a bad experience where a pastor was not what he was supposed to be. And I can empathize with that and understand that, and I'm sorry for that. And so please know that I'm not here to um, bully pulpit anybody from our church, and I also want to be careful knowing that there are folks in here who have been hurt by, um, in some cases, spiritually abused by a pastor. So I want to be careful with that. So as we read this, we'll, we'll get to the application for you and some of the specifics for you, but you're really reading the word of God through the hand of the Apostle Peter talking to me and our other pastors. That's kind of, over, kind of overhearing a conversation. Peter says, I'm an elder, a fellow elder. I saw Christ suffer, and I'm looking forward to glory. In the meantime, elders, pastors, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Now, this imagery of sheep and shepherd is all throughout the Bible. We have a very famous parable or story that Jesus tells in Luke 15, the story of the lost sheep, uh, a fictional story where a shepherd had a hundred sheep and one was lost. 
He left the 99 in the care of the other shepherds, and he went and pursued after that one lost sheep. And so Jesus uses the uh, shepherd sheep metaphor or imagery to convey God's love and affection for each one of us. It's not like God looks at you and says, man, you stink. I have these other 99. Have a good life. Now, Jesus says, I love the 99, and I love the wayward sheep as well. I'll go after him. I'll go after her. In Isaiah 53, we have the imagery of the sheep where the prophet says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned all of us to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. In Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul speaks to other pastors or elders from the church at Ephesus, and he tells them to guard the flock. He says, your overseers protect the flock. And he even paints the picture even broader where it's not just sheep, but there are also the the sheep are in danger of being prey to the predator, the wolf, the one that will come and devour the sheep. Jesus in John chapter 10 describes himself as the good shepherd. The writer of Hebrews says of Christ that he is the great shepherd of the sheep. Ezekiel speaks of spiritual leaders to God's people as shepherds and the people as sheep. But one that I want you to read with me, hold your spot, 1 Peter, and go into the Old Testament to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 23. Jeremiah was a prophet He's sometimes known as the weeping prophet because the time and the place and the ministry that God gave to him was very difficult. The people wouldn't listen. They wouldn't heed God's warnings. And so Jeremiah had a really tough task. Jeremiah chapter number 23 Here again, through the prophet, God is going to use this shepherd-sheep metaphor, that imagery. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away. You have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds. What a a terrifying statement there. It's in a little bit more of a classical language, but look at what God says. You have not attended to my sheep, so I will attend to you. Like That is a terrifying declaration from the Lord. Verse 3, then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of of all the countries where I have driven them, I will bring them back in their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. If you want to just jot down in your notes, Ezekiel chapter number 34, the first 10 verses there, very similar message from the prophet Ezekiel in the way that I kind of paraphrase what Ezekiel says there is you have shepherds not protecting the sheep, you have shepherds barbecuing the sheep. And so this imagery is seen all throughout the scripture. Now let's go back to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 2, to the elders, to the pastors, to the overseers, to the bishops, a more classical term there, shepherd, Pastor, the flock of God that is among you. Now, a few things to point out here that's really important. Notice the flock is not the pastor's flock. It is the flock of God. The church belongs to Jesus. The church is Christ's. There are other imagery, other images of the church in the scripture. One is a shepherd with sheep. Other times it is a bride. The church is called the bride of Christ. 
The pastor is not the groom. The pastor is a groomsman. One of my buddies who's a faithful pastor down in Virginia, he often will say we are called as pastors to care for the wife of another man. So the church is Christ's bride. Here in this image, verse 2, it is called the flock of God. But the pastor is called to shepherd the flock of God, lead the flock of God. Now, I just want to pause here because we all come to this understanding of pastor with some, some different baggage, with some different background, from some different expectations. And so hold your spot in 1 Peter. Go to the left. Go to the book of 1 Timothy real quick. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here are the qualifications for a pastor. In this case, Paul uses the word that we translate overseer. A couple different Greek words, one for elders and one for pastor and one for overseer and bishop. In the King James, this is translated bishop. 1 Timothy 3, 1, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Here are the qualifications, not suggestions, for what a pastor must be. Let's go back to First Peter. So Peter says, as an elder, speaking to the elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, exercising oversight. So we see that, that word overseer. The church is designed by God to be led by pastors. Notice I'm going to put that in the plural. Pastors. One of the things that's happened in our Western, particularly American culture, is we have really veered very far from uh, the, the scripture's idea of how the church is meant to operate as, as a family, as, a, um, as an organization, we'll use that word. Pastors are never supposed to be voted in or voted out. That's not a thing. I would go so far as to say congregational votes aren't in the Bible. The church is meant to be led by pastors who are held accountable by other pastors. That's very important. The shepherds are meant to exercise oversight, knowing it's not their flock, it's God's flock. It's God's people. As a pastor, it's very important for me to know that my time to, as Hebrews says, to watch over your souls is, is this big, and I'm going to stand accountable to God for how I use that leadership that he entrusted to me for this moment. It's God's flock. And elders, pastors, overseers are entrusted with the care of God's people. Now, what does it mean to exercise oversight? What, what does that mean? Now, I want to go a little further and then come back to that exercise oversight. So we first talk about what it does not mean. Look at verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, 
exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, here it is, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock or examples to the flock. So a pastor is not king. A pastor is not Lord. A pastor doesn't get to just do whatever he wants to do. I imagine if the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul were to show up in 2024 and look at the American church, they would be horrified. And I think one of the first things they would be horrified by is the exaltation of pastors. I don't know if you follow, I'll call it Christian news at all, but it seems like every week the next celebrity pastor crashes and burns. It doesn't matter if they're part of a Baptist church or a charismatic church or non-denominational church, reformed church. You can just, you, you can go on Twitter, you can go online, and you can see, man, this pastor crashed and burned. And part of it is because pastors somehow get in their head that they are the king, the Lord, the master. None of this is mine, and none of you are mine. And if I start acting like this is mine and you are mine, do me a favor and punch me square in the head. It's God's flock. It's not mine. It's God's bride, not mine. It's God's kingdom, not mine. It's God's house, not mine. So what does exercising oversight mean? Hold your spot in 1 Peter. Let's go back to the book of Titus, just to the left. Titus is known as one of the pastoral epistles. So pastoral letters, first and second Timothy, and then Titus. So Titus chapter number one. Titus chapter one. Verse number five, Paul's writing a letter to a pastor. His name is Titus. This is why I left you in Crete, verse five, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So right here, we see this idea of exercising oversight. Set what remains in order. So lead the church, shepherd the church, make decisions about the direction of the church. But also, we see it there at the end of verse number five, appoint elders in every town as I have uh, instructed or directed you. So a pastor, elders, are to set what remains in order and appoint elders. Jump down to verse number nine. What does exercising oversight mean? He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The only skill a pastor has to have is teach the word. It's the only non-negotiable skill. This is not meant to be mean but if there's a pastor who says, yeah, I'm not really a preacher, they're not a pastor. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm more of a behind-the-scenes pastor. They may be a great person, but they've been mislabeled as a pastor. A pastor's responsibility, core responsibility in this idea of exercising oversight is to teach the word of God, is to give sound instruction. Just in the book prior, Paul says to Timothy, another pastor, he says in chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. 
Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. In the book prior to that, in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, we see that one little phrase in verse 3, that he must be able to teach. Verse 2, he must be able to teach. In chapter 4, verse 11, command and teach these things. So what's the primary responsibility for an elder when exercising oversight over the flock of God? There is lead the church, appoint elders, but the primary responsibility is to teach truth and point out error. That's a pastor's responsibility. I I wrote it down as this. Guide the sheep to green grass and kill the wolves along the way. Which sounds so fun to me, I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Right? It's guide the sheep to green grass, teach the truth of the scripture, and along the way, as we're keeping the flock together, as we're we're staying together, there are going to be predators, there are going to be wolves, as they are likened to in Acts chapter 20, who come along the way, and the pastor's responsibility is to kill the wolf. Let's go back to 1 Peter. So this is the flock of God. Elders, you're you're likened to a shepherd. You're a pastor, shepherd, the flock of God that is among you. Exercise oversight. And we, we see a sequence here of how a pastor is supposed to do that. Not under compulsion. Not out of obligation, but out of willingness. The first qualification of being a pastor is desire. Is desire. That's why 1 Timothy 3 says if someone aspires to or someone desires the office, he must be these things. So not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, not for the money, I don't know any other illustration to use other than this because but this this one just is so memorable and makes me chuckle, but it's really serious. I had an uncle in the military and he said there were three things that burned down generals, ruined their careers. Guns, buns, and funds. I've always remembered that. And pastors, we don't have the guns. But what do you see destroy pastors all the time? Sexual sin, money, power. You see it happen. You see it destroy people. Peter says here, you be faithful to the flock of God and do so willingly but don't do it for the money. I'll hold your spot there and go back to Timothy real quick. First Timothy chapter number six. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 6. I love this verse. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. And this is not just for pastors, but this is for God's people. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, the craving of wealth, the craving of riches, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs, many arrows, 
The, the imagery is a guy standing there who's just being lit up by all of these arrows, and there are these pangs, these many sorrows, because it became about the love of money. Now, I just want to pause here because I don't want, you, I don't want to give you any impression that I am immune to any of these temptations. But how many churches have been destroyed because the pastor loved money and catered to the big givers sitting in the pews? Now, I can't deal with that sin because if I do, they'll leave the church because their sister's brother-in-law's cousin is that or does that. And if I offend them, then... Let me just tell you this. Maybe this is not the best thing to say. I find it super humorous when church people try to leverage me with money. I find it humorous because I don't care. Now you ask my wife, if I got 20 bucks in my pocket, I won't come home with 20 bucks because I'll have given it away, lost it, or bought something really dumb. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I just, I'm not a money person. Doesn't mean I don't like the stuff that money can get me, but that's it's not a crazy thing for me. So if you think you're going to come sit with me and say, Pastor, you know, we're really upset about this and we're, we're thinking about taking our giving somewhere else, forgive me if I laugh because I, I, don't, I don't play those games. But there are a lot of pastors who are in small churches Average church in America, around 70 people. And a lot of those men have greater courage than I do because they faithfully preach the word of God knowing that if they upset 10 people in their congregation, they won't get a paycheck. So when the word of God says, do this and don't do it for the money, it's real serious real serious. Let's go back to 1 Peter. So not for shameful gain, but eagerly, with zeal. Verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge. So you're not, I'm not a king, a pastor isn't a king or a lord but called to be an example. Paul said this to Timothy, be an example to the believers. Set an example in the way you speak, in the way you act, the way you interact with people, be an example to the flock. Here's why. Because the chief shepherd is going to show up. And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In ancient times when they would have athletic games or what we have come to know as the Olympics, they would receive a wreath. And it was a fading wreath that, uh, of, of different leaves that would be dead within a week. It would fade. The glory would fade. Even if it was a metal trophy, it would eventually rust and fade and tarnish and no longer have the shine or the glory that it did originally. Peter says to the elders, this is what you're called to do. This is how you're called to do it because the chief shepherd will appear and you will receive from him the unfading crown of glory. Now, you might be sitting here saying, okay, pastor, that's great. I'm glad that you're thinking about those things. You should think about those. You are a, a pastor. So what does that mean for me? What does that mean for you? First of all, I want you to know what to look for in a pastor and in a church. 
Every week, by the kindness and grace of God, we have guests who come in here. Some will return. Some will go off to find other churches. For some, this is a bit of a drive. For some, this is just not your style. Maybe it's too big. Maybe it's too loud. Maybe it's too this. Whatever it might be. You're, you're going to go and you're going to try to find a church that you can be part of, that you can fellowship with, that you can hear the word of God with. And often what happens when we look for a church, we don't look biblically. We look based upon our preferences. And we all have our preferences, and that's okay. I have my preferences. And you have your preferences. But if we don't know biblically what a pastor is supposed to be and not supposed to be, then we'll just go look and go, oh, that, that person made me feel good. I like their communication style. Oh, this, this, this place is nice. I, I like this environment. Rather than saying, are they going to open the Bible? Oh, there's no Bible there. Uh, check, please. Right, get us out of here. Wherever you go, the pastor ought to stand and open the Scripture. Now, they might open a paper Bible, like an old geezer, like I am, or they might have an iPad, or they might have it on the screen. Whatever it might be, is the Bible being taught? Is the Word of God being preached? That's the first thing you ought to look for in a pastor. If that's not there, don't look any further. The second thing for you, so what does this mean? what you should biblically expect from me. What you should biblically expect from a pastor. Some pastors will be great counselors, some will not. Some will be great administrators, some will not. Some will be extroverts, some will be introverts, and some will be like me, they will be ambiverts. They know how to be an extrovert, but they really like being introverted. Right? It's okay. It's not like, ooh, we have an introvert pastor. He can't, he's not qualified. No, no, no. Like, it's, it can be different. You can know what to expect. You can know how our church is going to operate. You also should know how the church is supposed to biblically function. I look around the room and I know some of you have been in church for a long time. I guarantee if we had a meeting after this that said, hey, just come and share a story of the worst church business meeting you've ever been in, there would be a lineup out the door. want you to know how the church is supposed to operate, but also what to expect from a pastor. And I say this with great fear and trembling. I want you to read verse 5 with me. Likewise, you who are younger, so typically the pastors would be older men, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I say this to you so that you can know what to expect in a pastor, but I also say this to you so that you can pray for me and our other pastors. I have no greater goal in my life than to finish well. And for many reasons, that is deeply painful for me.
So I ask you to pray. that God would keep me and keep our other pastors. And that if we step one inch out of line, God would thunderbolt crush us. Because how much damage has been done to the gospel effort by pastors who fell. How much heartbreak, how much sorrow. So I say this very clearly. Me, Keaton, our other elders and pastors here Not one of us are beyond destruction. It's a very sobering verse that a friend of mine shared with me this week as we were talking about this subject. If anyone thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he falls. Essentially, the moment you think you're on firm ground, watch out. Proverbs would say it this way. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So as an elder, I take very seriously the responsibilities Hebrews says to watch over your souls. I don't often or always do it very well. the next church you're part of or maybe you're just a guest stopping in today you can know what to look for in a pastor and know what the church is supposed to look like how it's supposed to operate and function but that verse there at the end of verse 5 has been something I think about very often God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's the gospel. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Meaning we can no longer believe in pride that we can earn God's favor or earn our way to heaven or be good enough. The good news is is that God sent his only son who lived the perfect life, died in our place, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose from the dead. And God opposes us when we walk in pride, but when we humble ourselves and we come to the cross and we say, Jesus, you are dying because of me. It is my sin that is placed upon you. I can't do it, but you did. And the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Let's pray together.